Ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh have accused Azerbaijan of violating a ceasefire deal. Authorities said gunshots were heard in the center of the regional capital. Azerbaijan has denied violating the ceasefire. This comes as representatives from both sides wrapped up talks in the city of Yevlah in Azerbaijan. The talks were scheduled after Azerbaijan secured a swift military victory over ethnic Armenian separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, Nagorno-Karabakh is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, even though most of its residents are ethnic Armenians. It has long functioned as a de facto autonomous region. Before we hear from our reporter in Yerevan, let's take a look at how events have unfolded before those reports of a ceasefire breach. The moment Armenian forces left their trenches. That's what this video published by Azerbaijan's Defense Ministry claims to show. Just one day after launching a military operation, Azerbaijan declared victory over separatists in the Armenian majority enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. As a result of the start of anti-terrorist measures yesterday, at approximately 1,300 hours, and their successful completion, Azerbaijan has restored its sovereignty. Tensions have been charged in the breakaway region after Azerbaijan blockaded the only road to Armenia last year that led to food and medicine shortages and accusations of ethnic cleansing. The latest round of fighting began after Azerbaijan's foreign ministry said four soldiers and two civilians had died in landmine explosions in the region. Drone attacks and artillery fire sent thousands of residents fleeing, many to a camp operated by Russian peacekeepers. But Armenian fighters were outnumbered and undersupplied, leaving them no choice but to lay down their arms. Across the border in Armenia, discontent with the government's handling of the crisis reached boiling point. The capital, Yerevan, has been rocked by sometimes violent anti-government protests. Many feel their leaders have abandoned ethnic Armenians to their fate. The whole nation disagrees with the surrender of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. No one agrees with it. And the government, our government, is inactive. It does nothing. The threat of a full-scale war has been averted for now, but the region lies in tatters. Azerbaijan's president has promised to turn it into a paradise and says he wants to integrate the population there, claims that ethnic Armenians are likely to view with more than a bit of fear and skepticism. DW's Maria Katamadze is in Armenia's capital, Yerevan. What are you hearing, Maria, from Nagorno-Karabakh about accusations that the ceasefire has been broken? Well, actually, we are hearing the same uh, from uh, local sources that uh, this ceasefire was uh, indeed uh, violated by Azerbaijani side. Uh, one Armenian journalist is telling us that the Azerbaijani forces are advancing from the outskirt of the capital city, Stepanakert, right into the city center. Uh, we managed to speak to some of the locals as well. They are telling us that they are rushing to the shelters that they can hear the uh, gunfire. So this, is, this, this was actually a very likely development, even though Azerbaijan uh, said that it, it, it would guarantee the uh, security of uh, uh, separatists and the security of locals. This does sound like a very fluid developing situation. Uh, what can you tell us about the implications of this for the safety of the people living in Nagorno-Karabakh? Yes, uh, it's a big concern now, the safety of uh, um, 
Karabakh Armenians uh, as Azerbaijan is retaking uh, the city, as Azerbaijan retaking the full control of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is uh, internationally recognized as uh, Azerbaijan's territory. So uh, the people that I spoke to uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh are telling me that they are worried that Azerbaijanis might uh, do something bad, they might detain them or do something even even worse, harm them. And uh, now, when the shilling apparently continues, as we are hearing, they are they are terrified and they are telling us that that's something they expected. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we will just have to uh, keep a close uh, eye on the developments. Yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on on those uh, reported reported violations of the ceasefire. But the there have been peace talks going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, those peace talks have now ended. Armenia has apparently, or rather, Azerbaijan has promised Armenia that it will guarantee the safety of the separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh. Do Armenians believe that? Uh, yes, indeed, Azerbaijan guaranteed the safety, but uh, Armenians uh, that we spoke to in Nagorno-Karabakh, they do not believe it. Uh, they're, they're saying that, uh, uh, actually, this is the official statement from Armenia as well, that Azerbaijan is trying, is, is uh, doing ethnically, uh, ethnical cleansing, and this is the crime against uh, humanity. Uh, but Azerbaijan uh, denies all the allegations, saying that it pro will provide safety. But people there do not believe that. Uh, they tell me that it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Uh, that Azerbaijanis are just going to leave them alone and uh, just continue their normal lives. No, they're telling me that they will likely have to flee their homes and especially men, for men who fought uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh wars, their, their safety is obviously at risk. Maria, thank you very much for that update. That was our correspondent, Maria Katamadze, in Yerevan. Well, as Maria mentioned, this conflict has been going on for a long time. Uh, to get some insights on what's happening in that region, let's bring in Elisa de Carbonell. She's Deputy Director for the Europe and Central Asia Program at the International Crisis Group. That's a think tank based in London. Elisa, thanks for being with us. The Azeris and Armenians have met for talks, but tensions continue to flare, as we just heard, over Nagorno-Karabakh. What can be done to secure peace there? So ironically, the talks that happened today um, in the wake of the halt of the Azerbaijani offensive between Azerbaijani representatives and representatives of de facto authorities in Nagorno-Karabakh um, are something that international mediators have pushed for for the past year, you know, to have these direct talks on the future and the fate of uh, some 120,000 residents living in Nagorno-Karabakh. Now these talks are coming under duress after 24 hours of this uh, lightning um, military operation by Azerbaijan. And the most important and critical thing now is how Baku manages the situation going forward and really takes into account the concerns of residents there, um, ensures the safety and security of the population, and, and most importantly, allows humanitarian organizations access. This conflict goes back decades with the Armenians accusing Azerbaijan of carrying out ethnic cleansing in the region. How can trust be restored between the two sides? I mean, trust is, is really not there at all. Um, this, it's particularly um, difficult uh, to have these conversations now in, in, after, after the military offensive, but also over the past nine months, residents in the region have been dealing with shortages of food, of medicines, of fuel, um, because of an effective blockade of the only road leading to um, the enclave, leading to Nagorno-Karabakh. So, I mean, they have, the residents there are exhausted, they're scared, um, they're especially afraid now because there have been rumors and reports that um, Azerbaijan wants to hold to account um, um, and will have some kind of filtration camps to arrest men who have been involved in the fighting not only in 2020 war uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but also um, in the previous war in the 1990s with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So they're very, very fearful.
So trust is in very short supply there. Uh, now, Russia is hugely influential in the region. Russia has had peacekeepers there. But last month, you were quoted in the Guardian newspaper as saying that the renewed eruption of this conflict was, quote, a sign of Moscow's weakness. What do you mean by that? So I think it's, um, it's Russia has been critical in brokering the ceasefire between Armenia and Azerbaijan in 2020, which led to the withdrawal of Armenian forces from Nagorno-Karabakh and its peacekeepers being deployed there. That was a hugely important, um, and it's continued to be involved in peace talks between Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, but alongside the European Union and uh, Washington. Uh, there were even two separate peace agreements, drafts in the works for a while. Really what we've seen um, is that since uh, its invasion of Ukraine, Russia has been distracted um, and its peacekeepers who lack a mandate in the region have really done um, very little to uh, be able to deter Azerbaijan's advances. And, and even during this military offensive now, we haven't seen extremely strong words uh, or condemnations from Moscow of Baku. Putin only weighed in after um, the halt in um, fighting. So it's really, um, Russia has shown itself either unwilling or unable to intervene at this point. Elisa, thank you very much for helping us make sense of that. Elisa de Carbonell of the International Crisis Group in London, thank you very much. Thank you. And for more on this, let's bring in analyst Zhao Sharia from the International Crisis Group. Welcome to the program and thank you for joining us. What is going to happen to the people living in Nagorno-Karabakh? Because they don't want integration with Azerbaijan, do they? Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting uh, and good morning. Uh, I think what will happen, uh, it's also, as you know, that today is a crucial meeting between Azerbaijan representative and, and the representative of the Karabakh I Armenia mean, has taken place in the city of Yablakh. And the outcome of this meeting is uh, pivotal in shaping the future developments. I mean, Baku and space presenting a timetable for disarmament and dismantling of the existing structure in Karabakh, as well as outlining its vision for integration. So how uh, they are alive, uh, the, how the integration will take place, this is also depends on the, the talks, uh, but uh, I can, <clears throat> I would like to say that also, I mean, there is also immediate needs uh, after this military operation, such as uh, the main people evacuated for different places, and uh, and they, there is a humanitarian uh, need is urgently needed, and uh, also the support uh, coming from the international humanitarian organizations. Remind us of the background of this conflict. Why is this region so disputed? Uh, Azerbaijan uh, doesn't see is a disputed region. Uh, the, the first war broke out in the early of 90s, which Azerbaijan lost uh, not only the uh, the former Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, it was the, the for, uh, Autonomous Oblast inside Soviet Azerbaijan. So when this, uh, the the first war broke out, in the, when the Soviet Union dissolved, and this was ended, Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan lost uh, seven adjacent territories uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, the, 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 the Nagorno-Karabakh itself. It took uh, uh, nearly 25 years, the negotiation between in Azerbaijan and Armenia, and there were some golden moments uh, which uh, uh, promised that they, the sides can reach a peace agreement without going to the war. However, uh, unfortunately, uh, this peace never came, and uh, uh, we saw the most militarization in the region since 2016, and, and then we saw a, a, a a, a, a six day, a six weeks war in the 2020, which as a result of the war, actually the, the reality on the ground has changed, such as Azerbaijan regained seven adjacent territories and also a portion of the former Nagorno-Karabakh autumn's oblast, and also uh, the Russian peacekeeping forces deployed to the region. However, uh, the existing structure, existing de facto also this uh, remain in place and they administered uh, this region. Uh, so from right. now or from, yeah. 
Sorry, um, you know, you, you just highlight, you know, how, how long um, this conflict has been going on there. And also that the mood is so charged um, and the positions are, are so deeply entrenched on both of these sides. You mentioned that these talks are expected to happen today between Azerbaijan and the Armenian separatists. And I'm just wondering if you can also um, give us a sense of what's at stake um, for the governments of these two countries, especially in um, Armenia, in Yerevan, for example, where we saw protests uh, happening yesterday. People People were quite upset about the government's engagement in these discussions. Uh, yes, I mean, coming, uh, so uh, as we can see, the talks with Armenia and the talks with Karabakh I mean, is a two separate track. So as we can see, this is an internal uh, the matter, I mean, discussion with Karabakh I mean, What is the role of the Armenia? There were concerns uh, when military operations start, even uh, long before that there could be a new war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, but it happened. It didn't happen, uh, and uh, and right now the situation at least uh, uh, stable between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and Armenia saw the discussion between uh, Azerbaijan and the Karabakh Armenians as an important uh, element of the peace talks. Uh, concluding the peace agreement between Azerbaijan and, and, and Armenia. So they expected from Baku to, uh, to to manage these talks. So that's why Armenian position was that this is uh, uh, right now the matter between Azerbaijan and Karabakh Armenians. Okay. They will define how. They... So that's why Armenia is uh, not a part of this uh, the process right now. And uh, definitely, as you described, there is uh, also the concern and there is a protest in, in Yerevan that why Armenia is not uh, acted. Uh, or, or, but the, the reality is that what, uh, how Armenia could act, uh, it's not the same situation as uh, was before the 2020 war. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, Analyst Zhao Sharia from the International Crisis Group, we appreciate it. Thank you.